Hello, people. You got me again, second time today. I know, sit down. It's very exciting. I have with me the most amazing, talented Anissa. I'm not going to pronounce her last name because I may insult her and she may walk off and never speak no, to me. Not at all. I'd love you to give it a go. Give it a go, Annette. Come on. You really want me to give it a go? Yeah, why not? It's all about trying. Okay, so Anissa Belonagoff. Close. Belonagoff. Belonagoff. No, see, I, I can't. Now I'm trying too hard. The fact is you tried. Wait, That's more important. I tried. My my job at SBS is not going to be offered to me anytime soon, <laughs> but I will get a job somewhere for having a go. Hey, great to have you on. We tried last week. Didn't work. Yeah, we did. It didn't work. I'm just trying to, like, make myself not look so red like I've been drinking because I don't drink. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks Second like I'm like red eye, blurry. I mean, I'm just in the corner, hiding away, lurking in the no, shadows. Don't look at me. No, I was just thinking you've been out in the sun, exercising, you know, yeah, getting thing. a little fit. Trying to. That thing. Trying yeah. To. Trying yeah. to. Now you your I went to your website. And I read all of the things that you do. Uh, so, it, my website's it, about to be updated, but yes. Oh, cool. Well, I felt that I needed to sit down and have a bit of a fan afterwards because there was just so much there. What, so much. So you've got comedy. I read street fighting. You're a, an artist, a model. Um, like you look like you do some type of working out because like those abs in the pictures were like I don't even remember last time I had abs like that. So how if if I said to you, which I'm going to, how would you describe yourself, Anissa? How do you describe yourself? I call myself creatively fluid. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. So um, my my sort of I guess if anyone if I was to introduce myself to anybody, I say I'm um, an actor, a comedian, um, and then anything else that potentially goes with that conversation, I just sort of slot in, but I don't list off 20 hundred things. Um, I think the thing for me, first and foremost, is that I, I'm creatively fluid. So what I find, and it's just my growings up, um, I started as a dancer, I love dancing, I've always loved dancing, I will continue to dance, uh, I teach dancing, that kind of thing in the past as well, and choreograph bits and pieces. And then from there it went into like fine art and painting and like, you know, paper mache and sculpture and all that sort of fun stuff that you do. And then um, it was constant, it's constant creative uh, for me. And then it got into film and making films and writing films and all sorts of things. So what I, what I sort of did, and it took me a long time because you don't realize you associate so much identity when you name something. Like you start to put yourself in a bit of a box when personally, this is what I believe personally, when you start to create a name to something because it puts certain like confound barriers, um, fences around the approach that people associate that word to. So I took me a while to find creatively fluid and um, that kind of came with the territory of understanding that I was drawn to so many things and people kept saying to me, you've got to pick one thing. You gotta pick the one thing or you won't be successful. You gotta pick one thing. And I'm like, but I can't because it doesn't work like that in my brain. And I realized I'm drawn to certain projects or certain things come to me and then I pick the avenue in which the thing can get made. So sometimes it's writing and I see the, the story and so it has to come from a writing perspective of writing a script. And then sometimes it comes from stand-up and comedy and, and it's going to be performed or it's going to be acting or it's going to be photography because I'm a professional photographer as well. Um, or it's going to be um, fine art and drawing or maybe it's through like an expressive form like, you know, modelling or dance or something like that. But I sort of think I find the avenue that best works for the idea and the project. Hmm, and that, I guess, that's why I call it totally fluid. Yeah. yeah, creatively fluid. There's a whole heap of comments going on about how much they love creatively fluid. And I think you know, that description will be um, appropriated by other people. But please, oh, look, please. hashtag it, creatively fluid. Yeah, hashtag, it, hashtag creatively fluid. But 
yeah, I, I get it. That really makes sense because when you, you know, like the, when you're in business, it's like you've got to specialise in something. You need a niche. And I found like my background's writing. I like to think I'm creatively fluid as well that when you say, oh, I can do that, people go, no, you just do this and they yeah. box you in as well. Yeah. Who needs that? No, and it, it, it really squanders to, I think, your self-expression of even just trying things because as soon as you box yourself into something, um, you decide that you were only limited to that skill set. And when I sort of started using the, th the phrase creatively fluid for myself um, was when I noticed I did lots of different things. Even for my photography, my final year project for my photography was animation. Do I know how to animate? No, <laughs> but I figured it out because it best suited that outcome that I wanted for that particular project. So it's interesting, like, as soon as I understood, like, why am I just interested in, like, dabbling in everything? And people kept saying, no, you have to just be this one thing. Like, I don't feel that way. I realized because it was, I kind of came to a space where uh, certain projects, um, you need to give them what they're warranted. And if you're that person that has that skill set that's flexible and you're not willing to, like, or not wanting to, pigeonhole yourself you open yourself up to so much more so have you always been the type of person that knew what they wanted to do and where they were going to a point yes I think where I got confused or or where my course kind of set off track trail is when I started listening to everybody else and not my own intuition uh which is something that I like. I would love to touch on today is the understanding of intuition, especially when it comes to ideas and and beliefs and goals and manifesting that. Because there is this like internal knowing that we sort of tune out somewhere along the line because we wanted we decided that we need to fit in or we need to get along with everybody or we had to go with a certain way of everyone else doing it, etc. Because that was the right way. Um, and then after a while, I kind of realized, like, I had lost from a kid. As a kid, my mother says, hands down, you knew exactly what you were doing all the time. Like, I would come home from school and I'd be like, mom, we're doing paper mache. And she would be like, how about we draw? And I'm like, no, it's paper mache. <laughs> we're doing paper mache. Um, so I knew from a very young age, like, in intuitively, exactly where I was kind of going with a lot of things and it always had to be around art and it always had to be about communicating the story and it always had to be about sharing with other people to allow people to connect and then it came from to a place where I realized that my knowing and my um my I guess my why was always about inspiring and empowering other people to do the same to step outside the confines of the construction in which we hold society in right now um, that is, it, that in a way is kind of stopping a lot of us from achieving what we want to do because we believe there's only one way to do it. Mm. And you're right. We stop listening to our intuition. You know, some people call it our gut. Yeah. And we second guess ourselves and we listen to the peanut gallery and yeah. we let them dissuade us from our path. When did you go, you know what? No. Nah. I'm just I'm going to listen to me for a while. I think, I mean, that was a hard lesson for me to learn. I thought I did that to a perspective, like to a, in a perspective I thought I did, like I thought I was like, oh, yeah, this is me. I'm totally doing this. And then I realised, no, I was still caring way too much what other people thought, way too much. Uh, so I went down this road of thinking I was doing something for me, then realizing I cared too much what other people think, then had to go back and rebuild myself. I went through a whole rebuilding. I think I've rebuilt myself. Um, Hales, Haley, who's with Obsessed Hub, um, she brings it up. She's like, I've been watching you. You reinvent yourself all the time. And I realized like for a while, I just kept having to reinvent myself because every time I did, I was finding myself again and I was putting away these other ideas of what other people had placed upon me that I had then convinced myself were my own ideas. Because when you think about your growings up and, and, you know, childhood and things like that, your ideas are never your own. They've been observed, right? They're ideals and aspirations and values and beliefs from people that you aspire, usually adults, aspire to be like. Because when you're a kid, all you want to do is grow up, right? <laughs> all you want to do is know. Yeah. No. You know? 
And so you create these um, value sets and these ideas and these perceptions of people and society and culture from the people you surround yourself with. And they're usually, you know, your parents, for example. Um, but at what point do we then stop and say, hey, is this what I really want out of life? Is this what I chose or was this like value set something that was thrusted upon me and I just accepted it because that's what everybody else did? And that's usually where I think midlife crises has come along <laughs> um, and people kind of question everything that they've kind of known up to this point. It also comes to a point of like what are you allowing yourself to learn and relearn because you don't realise that a lot of the habits that you've created are because of someone else's habit and not necessarily a choice that you made yourself. And the biggest example I found when I started reflecting on my own behaviours and what I can consider me and what I could consider my mum or my history or my family's history, etc., that was just passed through these bodies, was when I realised I did certain things a certain way because my mother did it that way or her mother did it that way or my father did it that way or the family does it this way or whatever it might be. And I never stopped to go, hang on a minute, not saying that this is right or wrong, but did I decide that? Did I decide that my habits and my actions and my attitude were my own or have I just mimicked that off something that was an image that was given to me as a child? I have forgotten the question. <laughs> I think I have too. We were um, talking about intuition and, and going yeah. with that. So I, I guess that's what you're saying, isn't it, that, yeah. you know, you started listening to yourself a little bit more. I think I only started really listening into myself probably the, like, honestly, I thought I was for many years, the past two years, two and a half, maybe three years is when I really started going, I have to break this persona of me down because it, I don't know what's me anymore and what I think is me and what isn't me. And so the last probably two and a half years um, is when I stepped into my full truth and just went, hang on a minute, let's rewind, let's actually have a look at the constructs of who this personality is and is it something that I can step into 100% and own every action and every attitude? Because when you can do that is a sense of freedom because you're not relying on anybody else's past belief systems or past you know, culture or whatever it might be. You've made a true decision for yourself. Hmm. And what did you notice were the changes? I know that you said there was a freedom, but what were the other changes that you saw within yourself when you went, you know what? This is the way I'm going to live my life. I think the biggest thing, and I've always strived for, even before I really started stepping into myself, was authenticity. Um, but when I, in the last two and a half years, I love I love all these comments coming up. This is so good. Um, in the last two and a half years, I think when I started really stepping into this and breaking down, and even to a process now, even through this whole isolation process, I've gone through another step through of, you know, preconceived notions of my life. Um, but when I started sort of like breaking this habit of being my old self and becoming into my new self was when I noticed things like authenticity really reigned through because everything I was doing, I was doing not for anybody else but my truest self. And I noticed people responded to that. Whereas you don't realise that because of preconceived notions, sometimes you do things because you think it looks good, you think um, people will like it, you think it'll be shareable, you think it'll be cool, you think, you know, it'll be controversial. Like you start doing these things because of something and not because you wanted to, mm. not because your soul decided it was, the great, you know, a good idea, not because, and then you always know if it's not the right thing because if you press that that button, that send button, that post button, whatever. And if you have that just instinctive gut feeling like, oh, I hope people like this or, oh, I've got to watch this to get see how many likes it is or, oh, I'm so clever, you know, whatever it might be. If you get that instant reaction of wanting to watch what you just did, that was past tense, that is not the moment right now that is past tense, then I know, for example, that you're not stepping into you know, your most authentic self because your authentic self wouldn't care. <laughs> How, as a performer, mm. so you, you do modelling, you're an actor, 
I, I watched your short movie, which was very funny. You're a comedian. How do you reconcile that with being a performer? Because isn't the art of getting on and performing receiving that feedback from the audience? Yeah. So, uh, like, what was the question around that? So when you're being your authentic self, when you put something out there, you're doing it because you, you're you not doing it to get something back. You're doing it because you're giving. Yeah. How does that reconcile with being a performer? Because getting out there to perform is mm -hmm. about getting something back from the audience. To a point. To a point. Um, I mean, for example, I don't know. I think, I think the best performers are the ones that know because you – I mean, getting back instant recognition from the audience is is great, is wonderful. But I guarantee you, even if someone, if so, someone who's like, I'm an actor and I want to always do acting or whatever, and that's something that's so in their heart space, so in their being, I guarantee if they walked up on stage and they got no reaction from the audience, it would not stop them from still wanting to do that. You know, it's not it's not completely reliant on an audience's reaction. It's the fulfilling notion of what that gives you. So regardless of whether I get a laugh or not, the stage is what I love. If the audience wow. gives me an amazing, you know, feedback, then, oh, wow, that was a bonus. But we talk about it a lot. I think, um, you know, performers in general talk about it, but your art form is, is giving that away. How what the response is from that does not, um, what's the word, dictate the worth of your art. You can definitely improve your art for sure, but that's your choice, not the audience's. The audience didn't decide, hey, you know, this is what she's going to talk about for comedy. Um, we're going to laugh here. She's going to pause here. She's going to take a bow here and she's going to get off stage. The audience didn't decide that. You decided that. That was your power to say, hey, this is my, and same with poetry. It's like, you know, what if you don't get a, a audience and like it's a sad poem and everyone laughs, like does that mean, you know, your art is not relevant? Of course it still is. It's just you don't, when you give that stuff away, you don't dictate what comes back. It's a big difference between pursuing and quitting, isn't it, is that if you're being authentic and you're, it's it's truly your love, nothing can stop you. I mean, I... I've, I've got my L plates on as a stand-up comedian and yeah. I do open mic. You don't go and do open mic because you're expecting a huge audience and lots of laughs because you, you, more often than not you'll get picked on by the MC who's been doing it for years and takes the piss out of you. And Absolutely. you're talking to, like, you know, the two drunks who are there every week and the family that you've managed to drag along with, you know, bribery of a stake. <laughs> And, and I think too, like going through that experience, as you would know, and it, it's, it, you know, like, you know, you're a beginner still and you know, you're testing material and you don't expect, you know, the audience to suddenly go crazy and go like, oh my God, you deserve a Netflix special. No, you rock up there because it's that passion of going, I want to be better at this. I want to enjoy this experience. I love the stage. I love that rush. And even for me, like if I, if I have a set that doesn't go well, it's not about beating myself up to be like, you know, oh, well, why didn't you do that? Why didn't you say that? Blah, 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 or blaming other people or anything. It's just taking that moment to reflect and be like, hey, look, you just did the work. Like the work is never linear. It doesn't just get better and better and better and better and better and better and better. You have to have these pivots and turns and lifts and drops and, you know, question things and challenge things and all that kind of thing because otherwise how is it meant to get better? If you've just decided you've hit peak, like where is there to go? So down from there. Exactly. And so you rock up on stage just giving. It's like I've written this thing. I have to give it away in order for it to become better. And you don't get to control the outcome of giving it away, what that looks like. And same with business. Like if you've got a small business, you've created an idea, you've created a product, you've created um, a service, and you've done it your way, right, because it's your business, 
And then you have to give that away. You have to show it off. You have to let it unleash into the world. And some people will like the outcome of it and some people don't, you know, but you don't get to dictate that. You have to have trust. I um, I interviewed a, a former Buddhist monk this morning, so I may have to combine your words of wisdom with his meditation and do a bit more pondering on that because I guess when you're immersed in something and so much is counting on it, sometimes we forget the reason we do what we do. And I guess that's why, um, you know, Simon Simek, you know, you, you know, your why became so important and so relevant because it reminded us that it, it's not about everyone out there. It's got to start in here. Absolutely. There's also another uh, another great book, two books actually, uh, Audience of One, uh, which is a great book, and also uh, The One Thing, uh, which is also a New York Times bestseller. And um, Audience of One talks about how you you need to stop thinking about the masses and you need to start thinking about the other version of you. Like there's another version of you out there and you're creating your art, your business, your purpose, everything for that other version of you. That's usually what we start with, right? It's usually because we were treated a certain way and we don't want to be treated that way again or we experienced something and we don't want to be experiencing that thing again. And for me it was like my whole purpose of what I do and how I want to try and inspire and, and um, motivate people to do what, you know, their loves and passions is because – the childhood version of me didn't have that role model. So I'm creating my audience of one, which is the other version of myself. And when you start to do that, there is another person that enjoys that and another person that needs that, another person that needs that. And that's when you create your audience. But if you start pushing yourself out to the masses and just think everybody's going to love me, then you're going <laughs> to fall flat on your face because you lose everything that is you in order to please everybody else. Mm. Oh, so, so, so true because then you're no longer thinking about you. And it's interesting, though, because we get told, particularly as women, that we're being selfish when we think of ourselves. The, um, the women, being a woman aspect, especially if you uh, identify, like I identify as a cis woman, um, so, you know, it, it's interesting having those kind of confines around you too that we're starting to break down in a way um, but we're still expected to do so much more in the grand schemes of our relationships than, say, our male counterpart. So, you know, there is still this idea that, you know, <laughs> men don't have to look like women check in with the family unit. Like women check in. And, I'm not saying I'm not saying all men. I know some yeah. men who do that. Um, let's just, I'm going from a, a general overview of an umbrella perspective of um, where we are still, women are expected to check in with other people, right, and are expected still to share that information on. Um, women are still uh, expected to sort of have this loving nature around things, to have this nurturing nature around things, to then also, you know, there's still this expectation of household um, organisation and, and um, what's the word, uh, organisation organizing everything all that sort of stuff household wise that's still expected to be very you know female dominated and the same with like outdoorsy things outdoorsy things are, st are said to be very more male dominated there's still these confines that, and constructs that we still create within this society and structure when it comes to you know um still male and female gender and it would be lovely if that could sort of break down and cross line because you do find when you are particularly entrepreneurial as a woman you're still expected to do everything else on top of what it is you're trying to pursue. Whereas I do find the conversation is still heavy towards, say, if a man has an entre entrepreneurial construct, uh, you know, goal, he is sort of seen to be allowed to drop the ball more on other things, you know, than a woman is. There is still that very big, we should be praising and supporting. And if there is a woman in your life that wants to go down that path and be like, hey, this is my number one thing, this is my focus, this is my goal, we should be gathering together as a community, as that family unit, to be like, hey, cool, yes, how can I help you out to support you to get to that goal, you know? 
Um, and it's kind of flipping that role gender because the man was so entrepreneurial and you know focusing a lot on his career ambitions and everything, and the woman had to support that. I'm not saying that that exists exists, uh, exists to the extent that it did previously, um, but it still it still has its its you know strength. Well, it's still not there that you and I are talking about it, and that exactly. or the conversation I have with a woman in business it'll come up where we talk about that, you know, it's not it's not a, a chasm, but there's okay. enough of a divide between, you know, men and women and how we're looked at and how we perform in yeah. the entrepreneurial or even in the performing world. You know, you, you look at, like, t let's take comedy. There are so yeah. many amazing female comedians out oh, there. But so you're still funny. these top-heavy shows with men, male yeah. comedians. And it's yeah. like, yeah, let's give the chicks a go because they're funny. Yeah, I think there's definitely some change in that too. I think in, in comedy it's kind of interesting because um, there is no, like, there is no sort of standard or bar with that because comedy is so broad in the way that it can be represented. Um, so it is interesting kind of watching, like, people, like people are at different levels and different experiences and all that kind of stuff as well. Um, but I do find there is still, and I've spoken to a, uh, some of my male comedian friends about this, but we still get highly judged. Like even if there is that space for a woman to hop onto, you know, a set or a, um, an evening, it'll be like, they'll give, you know, they'll be like, oh, we'll just put like two spaces of rock. We need two females. If you're lucky, if you're lucky, it'll be two females and then the rest will be males. Now I understand there's more men in that, you know, um area arena um so there obviously is more of a pool to choose from and i do notice that there are people actually making active choices and decisions of doing like a 50 50 split um you know uh or even just a broad range of um, gender identifiers um and ethnic backgrounds and all that kind of stuff so there is definitely diversity coming through and making and the room runners are making conscious choices about that i have had um, some of my my male comedians say to me that female comics are, are, are at a higher demand now because, um, you know, people want to see more females doing it. Um, I get that that might be their experience, but I still get put through the ringer and, you know, and have to go through these very male-dominated rooms to get considered. And then I go to a female, like, say, a female-only night or something like that. Like, I did that in Perth at Lazy Susan's. Amazing. I think it's Lazy Susan's in Perth at the Brisbane Hotel. And I had a, a, a just a full female night. And hearing those other female comedians' experiences in other places, they were from Adelaide, Perth, all different cities, were exactly the same as my experience. And I just thought there is a culture there that needs to be broken down if we are all experiencing the same thing. I just know from my level, you know, open mic, that you go to these events and the male comedians yeah. have got their little cluster and yeah. you walk in and you go, you know, because you get to know people. You go, hey, how are you going? And it's almost like they don't know how to treat you or how to interact with you. Mind you, yeah. though, most of them are, you know, like 20-ish and I'm 50. So it could be like, oh, shit, mum's in the room. <laughs> She's yeah, here to make but I think, No, I find the same thing in that a lot of them were very standoffish to me when I first got started and I had to break down those barriers with them. Um, I did find to, you know, being in a male-dominated, and this could be in any male-dominated industry, um, you, uh, unfortunate truth, um, you are sort of judged as a sexual object first and foremost and then your talent is then acknowledged um so i had a lot of guys who said to me like um you know i didn't i didn't think you were going to be funny and because I was like, you're attractive because i was considered attractive uh and then a lot of them you know would say things like and a couple of them have acknowledged it now they're like oh yeah i didn't think you were going to be funny so i you know i just tried to hit on you at first like <laughs> you know and it, like i thanked them for their honesty um but it's one of those things where like one of my greatest friends who's a, who's male in 
in the comedy world, um, straight male, um, is one of my greatest friends because he was the only one that didn't look me up and down and look at me like a piece of meat when we started. And I was like, this guy actually gets that I'm here for a purpose that I'm trying to pursue, just like they take it all seriously. You know, some of them bring their notes and their papers and they're sitting there practicing and all that kind of stuff. I'm here to do the same thing. Just because I'm female, just because I'm dressing myself up to perform does not mean that I'm here for an alternative, ulterior motive to what I am currently pursuing my goal in being here for. No girl decides that, I don't know, I'm going to dress up and write a comedy set for three minutes just because I want to hook up with some guy. <laughs> There's far easier ways to do it. Far easier ways. Far easier ways. And cheaper ways. Because I, my experience of open mic is it actually costs me more money to go because you've got to drive to get there. You got, you'll have dinner, you might have a drink, and then you've got to drive home. You're doing it. I don't know anybody who would do open mic comedy because you, you're you not being paid. You're doing it because you love it, yeah. you know. It's the, the, the joy of maybe making someone laugh. Yeah. And I, and I must, like, pre-frame this too. This is not me man-batching. I, I love men. I, I think, you know, there are some amazing men in my life, absolutely amazing men. But the fact that that culture in comedy still exists because that's learnt behaviour, you know, that's not, that's a learnt cultural behaviour that you walk in and this is the way it goes kind of thing um, because people want to fit in and they want to fit in with what's done before and all that kind of stuff. And the fact that I didn't want to do that, I didn't want to just go to open mics all, all the time. Um, I wanted to have real big purpose to be there and why I'm there and all that kind of stuff and hone my craft and everything and, and be very selective with who I spent my time with in that and who I, you know, which rooms I went to and all that kind of stuff. A lot of people kind of downgraded me and didn't consider me serious because I was being so selective. And I kind of went, at, the moment, at first I was hurt because I thought, oh, maybe I'm not doing this right. And then I realized, no, no, I'm doing this right for me. This does not take away my goals and aspirations. If anything, it says more about them than it does about me, that they consider having to go so frequently and so often to all these different rooms is their way of success and not seeing beyond that. It says everything about them and nothing about me. If I'm being very selective and I'm honing my craft and I'm showing up and I'm giving 100%, 10% and I'm learning from that experience, then I'm doing what they are doing. I'm just doing it in my way. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a lot of... Um, I feel like there's a lot of judgment too when you start to choose how you want to go about things, especially if it's against the norm that has come before. And I'm sure you've experienced something like that too, Annette, if you've, if you've decided to do something a little bit differently and people have gone, no, that's not right. Yeah, you can't do it like that. I know I did raw comedy and, you know, they've got all of these rules and the two years that I've done it, I've sat there and gone, I'm following the rules, No, nobody else, you know, like I'm keeping my language down because age appropriateness and, and I'm sitting there and I'm going, you know what, if I don't win this, it's not because I didn't follow the rules or I did, it's because I stayed true to what I, how I want to deliver and how I want to be seen. I don't want to be seen and I can be crass with the best of them, like dirty, filthy, gutter mouth wash my mouth out with soap like foul but yeah. I also if I'm going to do comedy I want to be able to make it uh, readily available for audience so you know yeah. it's it, it's got a cheekiness to it but yeah. you know there's like some of the stuff I've seen is like oh my god <laughs> I think I've got to clean my ears out I think um like I did I've got a set that I'm working on at the moment which goes into sort of my new show, which is really about um, putting some very uh, big focuses on how we have this um, judgment for ourselves and then our judgment for others and, um, and you know, standards for ourselves and then standards for others and all this sort of stuff. Um, and one of mine, and like I never thought I would write it and apologies for anyone listening if you find this offensive, but um, essentially it's a 
it's an abortion joke, but it's not a joke about abortion. It's a, it's a joke about how awful this male person um, treated me a, as a female um, that it got so awful that I had to kind of completely go in a different direction to show how awful this was. And I think too, when people look at things like comedy, comedy is um, great in that aspect. It's, I mean, some of the, I say young people, I guess I'm still a young person, but um, <laughs> these these younger, like I say more like 18 or whatever, just coming onto the scene, they're kind of going down this, sh this shock comedy um, and you would have seen it. It's yeah. not really comedy. It's kind of like, I'm just gonna shock people to be nervous to laugh and that kind of stuff. Um, and it's not funny. It's <laughs> no, you're they laughing. Want, they want to be political, I'm but it's, yeah. Anyway, um, and I was very hesitant to go down a road that um, was potentially, you know, graphic content and that kind of thing because I didn't really, you know, want to go down that road as, as a comedian. But then when you start seeing topics and, and um, things that you want to say, sometimes – the joke writes itself. And I think the other thing to take note is as much as sometimes you do have like your little political statements in comedy, you write for the joke. And I think that's where a lot of audience members get lost is like they genuinely believe that the comedian 100% believes in the joke in which they're telling. There'll be elements of truth, absolutely. But, you know, you thinking that they talk like that outside of this is it's probably not right. Like it's it's probably not them. They're writing for the joke. They're writing for the performance. Just like, you know, if someone jumps up on stage and they're playing, I don't know, Hannibal Lecter, you don't all of a sudden think that they are Hannibal Lecter, you know. Um, but there is this association with this idea of um, comedy that is the persona. I guarantee you I've met, I've been fortunate enough to meet some very famous Australian comedians. They are nothing like they are on stage. And I mean that in the nicest way. Like, yeah the nicest way they know how to play the jokes they know how to play the comedic persona anisa belanogov is very different well not very different she's still an element of me but she's a different part of me anisa b on stage for comedy different part she swears i don't swear in normal everyday life if i swear my friends are like are you okay <laughs> but on, <laughs> on stage in comedy anisa b swears you know that's my outlet for that but if you expect me to to hear me swear like I do on stage, you won't. Like, um, there's that element too, which is nice. I and always find it funny with comedy is that people will go, go on, tell us a joke. And it's like, I am not a performing monkey. <laughs> oh, I feel like saying, you know, whenever someone says that to me, it's like, oh, tell me a joke. And I just turn and I say, look, if I was a heart surgeon, would you just turn around and say to me, give me open hearts? Surgery right here, right now, you know, free. No, you got to pay for it like everybody else. Yes. Go on, get on the table or get started. Get on the table. Give me a couple of grand and I'll do it. Yeah, I've got Grey's Anatomy, I know. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> oh, and Lisa, look, we're going on to 40 minutes and I know oh that you've, you've got things on today that you've got to do and it's been an amazing conversation. I it's love your work. Yeah, I've loved sorry, hearing. Sorry if, anyone, if, if people wanted more dad jokes, sorry, guys. You're just going to have to pay for a ticket like everybody else. Like. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, girls and boys. Oh, so it was amazing. Look, uh, you can go and check out Anissa or AnissaB.com, isn't it? Have I got um, that right? It's Anissa.com.au. Anissa.com.au. Look, if and, you Google me, I come up. I'm really not hard to find. No, it's, it's not like um, you've got a very common name. No, no. no it's been like, a Nisa comedy, you'll find me. It's easy. You're there. I'm well, there. you're amazing and I've loved talking to you. Go Thanks. on. Continue dominating the world in your wonderful way and we'll talk to you again soon. Talk to you guys soon. Mwah, loved it. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Bye.